Hi, my name is Cody Kalinowski and I'm a cowboy here at the George Ranch. Um, today we're going to do a little discussion about some longhorns. Um, the particular breed of the Texas longhorn, its, it's origins date back um, all the way to the original Spanish cattle brought over to Hispaniola and later on the North American continent in the late 1600s by the Spanish. Now they're free um, grazing, free ranging um, practices within their little society. Um, it, it left a lot of um, loss of, of structure in the end when it came to keeping their cattle in one concise group um, as they went and explored the southwest of what would be the United States. Um, as a result of this, a lot of cattle um, ended up escaping um, into the wild and establishing these feral wild herds. Now over the years and years of kind of natural selection um, and then them breeding on their own in the wild and having to uh, survive by themselves, rely on their um, particular genetic traits um, to succeed um, resulted in what we know as today as the Texas Longhorn. This is Tex and Shorty. Um, they are two great examples of well full grown Texas Longhorn steers that um, we have here at the ranch. A couple things about the Texas Longhorn as far as physical traits. The first thing that you can notice which it's in its, it's, in its name, um, right there are those long, long horns. So those are great for self-defense. Um, when these cattle were on their own in the wild, um, they did have the need to have to fend for themselves against things like gray wolves, mountain lions, and coyotes. Um, so though that's kind of how those horns developed over time. Um, the original cattle brought over by the Spanish uh, were a lot narrow in horn structure and bone structure. Now, to kind of touch on some bone structure, you can see Tex and Shorty, um, they're pretty wide in the shoulders, wide in the hips. Um, your female cattle, they really benefit from having wide, wide hips um, for a nice wide um, birth canal when they do go to um, start having calves. Um, the less time that they spend on the ground um, in the birthing process, um, the better. When, the, when a cow's on the ground having a, a, a calf, they're pretty mobile. They can't really fend for themselves at all, making them a quick, easy meal for something to come to buy. Uh, the, here's all the commotion, it feels pretty hungry. Kind of a little key aspect on things like their horns, not only are they great for self-defense, um, but those horns can also be a cooling uh, mechanism for that animal. Um, Tex here can circulate core um, blood from his body. Um, that's usually around the high 90s to, and then to the, and the 101s. Uh, Fahrenheit wise is body temperature. Um, he can circulate that blood to the tips of those horns, um, let the air kind of cool that blood off and then re recirculate that blood back, back to his body. Um, so that's a nice little built in AC um, system that these animals have. Now, as far as their color goes, um, longhorns aren't usually a particular color. Your orange and brown and red um, fur coats are, are fairly common, but there is no um, singular fur pattern or color like you would see in like your Angus cattle or your Charlay cattle. Um, they, they come in all types of different colors and, um, and such. And their, their demeanor, um, Longhorns are a pretty, pretty level-headed, calm cow. Um, they're, they're not real, real wild, real spooky at all. Um, they're not really aggressive unless you pressure them. Um, like any animal, once they feel cornered and threatened, they will lash out and try to defend themselves. But in the most part, they don't they don't have any type of mean intention in their head. They'll go up, go after us cowboys or nothing like that. So um, they're pretty nice to work with overall. So early economic use for these animals, um, believe it or not, beef was a happy byproduct with these with these longhorns here. Um, a lot of the original longhorns they were really processed for their tallow. Um, they were used as pack animals. A lot of their hide was used for a lot of leather components for the clothing that, that the settlers would wear as well as some of the tools they would use. Um, the horns, they were really used for things um, such as candles, cups, um, little things around the house that make life a little bit more comfortable for some of these early, early settlers um, since natural ores and, and things like that such as tin and your steel and your iron were kind of rail, rare to, to kind of um, forage around um, Texas here. Now later on, as we, as we approach the 1860s, um, as the railroads finally kind of start to connect across the U.S., um, the use of the Longhorn um, still had that main tallow component. 
um, a lot of the adhesives and things like that that were you being used to kind of complete some of the railroads um, things to kind of treat their canvas as far as keeping the water out of their tents um, the tallow was a very very important um, component that came from the fat of these animals um, the, like I said earlier the beef it's still a happy byproduct at this point um, now here in Texas we had a really big beef boom at the time with a couple of an unfortunate circumstances such as the north they really they really use up their beef supply during the civil war um here in texas um, we had an extreme abundant amount of beef here with a lot of wild um, cattle mainly in the southern parts of texas um, so with the lack of beef everywhere else across the country we had a chance to bring our cattle here from texas um, across to other poor part, uh, parts of the country um, for a pretty hefty price um, to help benefit texas ranchers now Later on to the 1890s, as more European breeds are kind of brought over to, te uh, to Texas and the southern United States, uh, the use of the Longhorn and its popularity um, kind of was overshadowed by the lean um, nature of its beef. Um, this, this particular breed isn't really known for having great quality steaks that we would order at a steakhouse if you'd go to a, a salt grass um, and order a Longhorn steak. They're more um, liable to probably bring you a piece of boot leather to chew on. Um, so there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of great um, taste and then intramuscular fat that we're looking for in a steak out of these cattle however um, they are pretty lean um, and they they have a very very extreme amount of hardiness and toughness to them um, so they were very popular as lead steers as these ranches would drive their cattle north along long distances um, they would use older steers older cattle such as tex um, and even shorty's age um, even though he's only about six um, to set a pace for a particular herd that way that they weren't walking off all of their um, all that hard-earned um, weight that these that their cattle put on over time now our current use for these cattle um, their hides their horns um, that's kind of the, the big selling point with this particular breed a lot of decoration is made um, a lot of furniture is made from their hides and horns alone um, but however that beef is still um, harvested from this animal nothing goes to waste when we process these animals um, in the end um, they've really kind of found a niche market in our health our current health industry um, their, their meat is really lean there's not a lot of fat involved um, so in that way they're kind of popular and also um, for breeding purposes like I mentioned earlier um, those nice wide hips of theirs um, that help with their birthing processes being very easy on their own um, that's kind of preferred in a lot of the um, cattle breeds nowadays a lot of your European breeds such as your Angus um, they don't have that particular trait. Usually they're very narrow in the hips. Um, so adding that little genetic quality um, into a rancher's herd is sometimes kind of preferred. And, then, and, and these longhorn cattle do um, fit that role. Um, I have a little bit of a continuation of the story of the longhorn before we finish today's video. So by the 1900s, the Texas longhorn was in trouble. Their lean meat was not favored on the market anymore, and with the rise of trains and barbed wire, cattle drives weren't as common, and the Texas longhorn almost went extinct. So in 1917, Bevo, the Texas Longhorn, was adopted as the mascot of the University of Texas at Austin, and that did make the breed a little bit more popular. In 1927, the U.S. Forest Service rounded up two herds to, pr to protect the species. Um, there was a herd that was put together by J. Hatton and W.C. Barnes over seven years, and that herd lives at the Wichita Mountains Wildlife Refuge. There's another herd that lives in Nebraska. J. Frank Dobby wrote a book called The Longhorns in 1941. It was a critical and commercial success, and it's considered one of the best descriptions of the tradition of the Texas Longhorn. The official Texas State Longhorn herd lives at Fort Griffith State Park and has about 250 head of cattle in it since 1948. The Longhorn Breeders Association of America, or TLBAA, was established by Charles Schreiner III in 1964. He started a herd at the Y.O. Ranch in Mountain Home, Texas. That was his herd and his ranch, uh, and it was a tribute to the legacy of his grandfather. Uh, now, today, after the Texas longhorn species was saved in the early 1900s, um, longhorn have sort of seen a resurgence. Many people grow or Many people raise longhorns because of their heritage and because of their history in Texas. So it's really thought of as more of a heritage specialty breed and not a breed that you necessarily raise for benefits. Uh, now, having said that, longhorn beef has, again, made a comeback because of the health benefits. It is lower in calories, lower in cholesterol, and it's lean overall. 
Uh, since longhorns give birth relatively easily and often, they are highly sought after to intermix with other beef cows because beef cows do not do either of those things very well. So um, they are a really highly sought after cow now because people are realizing that their genes are utterly fantastic. So I hope you learned about the Texas longhorn today. Every single day of uh, some sort. Now these two, or excuse me, these three cattle here that are walking out. Um, this biggest guy in the back, that's Tex. Tex is now a 19 year old steer. Um, he weighs around 1800 pounds, probably a little bit more after breakfast. Um, from tip to tip, you're looking around six and a half feet from each of those horns of his. Um, per horn, around 70 pounds. That head in total is over 300 pounds altogether. Shorty, um, that's the next biggest one um, to Texas left here. Um, Shorty's a six year old steer. He's around 1,100 pounds. He's kind of our Texan training. Um, once Tex here kind of retires, Shorty will kind of take up the mantle um, and be the big kahuna here in the pins. And that little bitty guy on the end right there being a little bashful, um, that's Pee Wee. Pee Wee is a little old. It'll make it more exciting. No, no, it won't. Okay, whenever you're ready. Um, now, the bigger breed of cow we're about to today, its origins date back to the original Spaniard. Excuse me. She said some other habit. Did you pull your shirt out of your pants? No, she grabbed my vest and my shirt with it.